Hi, I'm Dr. Paul with Online Chiropractic Marketing Systems and welcome to the Chiropractic Personal Injury Marketing Show. And we're talking with Brad Souders, who's a personal injury attorney right here in Tampa. And Brad does something really unique and he, uh, he, he goes after a niche market. He goes after motorcycle injuries and does a very good job marketing that. And the topic we're talking about today is the factors that um, doctors do that negatively impact the case. So. Uh, Brad's going to help us with that. So appreciate you being here today with us, Brad. Thank you for having me. Good. And uh, if you don't mind, can we go through uh, the short list of some of the, uh, and again, you've, you've been experienced this. You've been at this for 20 plus years, right? Thank you. Oh, is that a sound right? That's right. correct. Okay. Okay. So you've seen, you've been around the block a little bit. A few times. Okay. All right. Let's go into um, some of the top factors um, that doctors do that n will negatively impact your personal injury case. I'd say number one is poor record keeping. Now, when you say poor, you know, that's a very general term. When you say poor, how would you uh, get more specific with that? Well, for example, when I've seen the patient or the client reach maximum medical improvement and I order the records from the primary treating physician, mm -hmm. one or two things can happen. He, can, he or she can send me a chart that is this thick, very, very small, with very poor documentation, or can send me a chart that has documented the injuries. Okay. Let me be a little clearer with that. When we say poor record keeping, you're referring to content more than uh, looking at the records and being able to understand them, or both? Well, I'd like to see some minimum elements. I'd like to see an initial narrative report. For example. Okay. And that initial narrative report is going to cover minimum the patient subjective complaints, the history of the accident. Okay. Uh, typically a prior medical history, if any. Uh, physical examination section mm -hmm. where they've done maybe a straight leg raise mm -hmm. and maybe it's positive. Um, you know, but basically examination cervical, mid, lower spine, if those were the chief complaints, mm -hmm. I want to see physical examination section in that narrative report and I want to see examination of those parts of the body and I want to see maybe tenderness, muscle spasm, restricted range of motion, mm -hmm. positive straight leg raise those sort of things. So you want the uh, you want it in a narrative format. You don't uh, appreciate it then when they just send you the res their copy of their exam findings. Does that sound right? Correct. I, I prefer, and I, I think I speak for most injury attorneys, we'd like to see an initial narrative report. Narrative, okay. And that's also, of course, going to include the diagnoses, mm -hmm. um, what their initial impressions are, of what the patient is suffering from. Mm -hmm and of course a plan section such as recommending PT three times a week for so many months ahead okay. and revisit. Okay, so just in summary you have here um, the chief complaint in narrative format, the, um, you have prior medical history, mm -hmm. okay, so you want those in a narrative format. And it just needs to ask the patient, have you had any previous uh, events mm -hmm. of trauma? where you've suffered any injuries to mm -hmm. any parts of your body. Uh, because as we've discussed before, that's important that the doctor also has a complete history. Right, okay. And then you have uh, physical exam findings and the diagnosis and plan, okay. Yes. Um, you have here final report. Can you comment on that? Yes, thank you. Um, a lot of physicians will ask, do you also want um, interim reports? or updated reports, and I'm not so much a believer in that. I think as long as you, the physician, do your initial narrative and then meet your other requirements mm -hmm. or requirements of keeping good soap notes, if you will. Okay. And when you reach the point of saying, you've reached maximum medical improvement, I can do a final report, this is what I'm talking about. Personal injury attorneys need final reports from the primary treating physician. Okay, okay, final report. And then billing, you have a comment here on billing. What, what are they doing wrong with billing? Well, if I can step back for a minute to the final report. Okay. A question that's often asked is, do you 
the personal injury attorney want an impairment rating. Okay? And your opinion on that? From my perspective, my answer is no thank you. And why because is that? I've seen that sometimes uh, limit the value of the case. In what way? There's some adjusters out there that have a school of thought that if it's a 10% rating, then it will only be a value case in X range. Okay. So I try to, um, I hope that physicians who are writing final reports mm -hmm. for the clients in my office mm -hmm. are not giving impairment ratings. While I need the their opinion about the permanency of injuries. Okay. That is something that every personal inj injury attorney needs in okay. the report. Which is different than an impairment rating. Correct, correct. Okay, I see. So the personal injury attorney needs the physician to address permanency of injuries, but some attorneys like myself do not want the physician to go further to actually quantify the impairment rating and to a and it has more to do with you feel like you're being boxed in Correct. on a number what Correct. if what if, um, what if what if we were to say that the impairment rating was one of the primary financial drivers of um, the insurance industry in their re in their awards what would you feel about that I disagree with that is that respectfully right? okay so you really just want to go after it so you want a a permanency an opinion of permanency yes Yes. And then you just don't want to be boxed in with an impairment report. Correct. Okay, okay, I got you. Let me ask you a question about handwritten versus, have you seen the, gene the generic software written type of narratives and reports? Have you ever, there's software out there, are you familiar with that? I've seen software where physicians might even use a scanner, like barcoding right, right. system. Right, right, what's your opinion on that? And I'm not overly impressed. Why? Um, oftentimes, the phrases aren't matching each other, it's difficult to read, it's not personalized, and if I have my preference, mm -hmm. um, if I was asked, mm -hmm. I would prefer the treating physician not use one of those. The, the generic software. Right. And then um, I'm sure you probably have gotten in reports handwritten and you couldn't read them. Let me just go back for a second. I don't know if other people impression those scan reports this way also, mm -hmm. but it also may give the impression that that physician is, is running a volume type practice. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the time and he is just coding things mm -hmm. uh, very quickly uh, without focus and attention perhaps. Yeah, yeah I've always said, uh, well, you don't want that to come up in a trial that use generic software for the notes, mm -hmm. you know, that just doesn't come across real well. What about, um, the? so what's the preference you do when is it more like dictated and transcribed? Well, my preference is that initial narrative report and that final report. And for those soap notes in between, you know, those are, that's basically your travel card right. or your other ways which you do your soap notes. So you're okay with copies of the soap notes then? Well, I receive copies all the time. I right. never receive originals. Right, right. I mean copies of the soap notes as opposed to narratives of the soap notes. Oh. So just no. a, a really a, an initial narrative, a final narrative, mm -hmm. and copy of the soap notes. With the expectation the doctor is meeting the, re the minimum requirements by law that he's obligated to follow when he you know, sees a patient. And there are minimum right. requirements for, for record keeping. Right, right. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay. Anything else in regards to, because that's a really big issue right now is note taking and documentation. Any other comments about? Uh, Just one more thing is that insurance companies um, have been denying doctors um, or orders or payments on diagnostic studies. And they'll say, they'll question the medical necessity of maybe the MRI mm -hmm. or of the NCVs. Mm -hmm. So many years now, every chance I've gotten, I've shared with these doctors, if you're ordering a diagnostic study, put in those subjective complaints and the reason why you're ordering the study. Okay. For example, patient complains of cervical radiculopathy extending to the right extremity. You know, mm -hmm. So if you're documenting the pain and numbness or the radiculopathy into the right upper extremity and you say, 
I want to rule out a herniated disc, so I'm ordering a cervical MRI. How long did that just take? It right. took me 10 to 15 seconds to say that or to write that. Mm -hmm. And now you've documented the chart. Mm -hmm. So if, if any time comes up later, they're trying to deny this study, because you know they don't like to pay right. you know, diagnostic studies. Right. You can point to the chart and you can see that the patient was having those complaints and you had a legitimate concern and you had a, a true reason for mm -hmm. ordering this study yeah, and it was medically necessary. Sense. Okay, and, and so what have you seen doctors do that are negative with the reports? They just don't include an initial report? I've seen it all. You know, you've, I've seen a doctor that received a patient and uh, I thought he'd be happy to get the patient, you know, or a referral. Right. And um, let's say I didn't see him give the importance to the occasion. Right didn't really chart the patient, didn't really record the complaints, and it's like that example I gave earlier. Okay. Four months later, when I ordered the chart, it was like this. Right. This, okay. you know, two yep. or three pages. Okay. And so you left leaving out these steps? Just really leaving out everything. Okay, okay, that makes and sense. And that hurts the patient, it hurts us, because when we go to submit our demand, and we're submitting something skinny like that to the insurance company that did not document the complaints right. or the problems this, okay. this per person was having, then you know nothing in means nothing gained. Right. So let me be clear with the documentation. You definitely like initial reports to include all the chief, all the different chief complaints, uh, all the medical prior history, the phys all the physical examinations, all the separate diagnoses, and the treatment plans for those diagnoses. Um, and preferably dictated uh, and transcribed in that format. Comprehensive initial exam results in a comprehensive initial narrative report. Gotcha. Okay. Now, uh, billing. Excuse me. And I think you can do that in most cases in four, maybe five pages or less. Right. Right. Okay. Um, billing. What's your comment on billing? The negative aspects. Um, that doctors would do relative to billing? Well, example of recent is we ordered uh, records from a physician close by and he demanded prepayment, um, prepayment for copies. Right. And so we made the prepayment, the records came in and maybe there were only 10 records. Right. And maybe eight of them were from this office it was the request letter, the enclosed HIPAA, and the fact sheet, and he he is billing us a dollar per page. Mm -hmm. And you know, first we're disappointed that there wasn't more of a chart, and second we're disappointed that he's charging us for records that are no, of no benefit to us. Okay. And that just that that that's a that gives a that gives the personal injury attorney a bad impression of the doctor. Now, uh, you lost me a little bit there when you said uh, no benefit. What, what, did, what was it that you didn't get benefit from that? We expected to order a chart. Okay. We got... Okay, so you didn't get content, Correct. essentially. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay, I see. Uh, anything else in regards to billing? I think we could probably come back to that. I had a thought or example later, but okay. it's just slipping me at the moment. Okay. All right. Good. Um, what about? Um, can we talk about overbilling? Maybe is that a mm -hmm. is that a problem that you're seeing with the doctors? Overbilling for their cases. I would say it's more the exception than the rule. Okay. So it's not common. Mm -hmm. How big of a problem is it? if you get a case that's dramatically overbilled. How big of a problem is that for you? It's not something that, that you know, it's, it's, it makes it more difficult to settle the case. Okay. All right. Um, let's go to the next one. Failure to order, test, or make referrals. Okay. Um, help me out with that one. Sure. Um, I'm on the, f I receive a call this morning of a client whose accident was five months ago mm -hmm. and I referred him to a local neighborhood chiropractic physician within a week post accident. 
So he's been treating with that physician for almost five months. Okay. And now we're in the fifth month, and I'm ordering. I can. He's. He's. I, I understand he's at max medical improvement. So I'm ordering the charts. And he says to me, Brad, I still have this ankle issue. I'm five months after accident and it's still swelling and it's still giving me pain. And I asked him what the doctor's done and the doctor said, well, he knew a few orthopedic physicians in town, but no one, none, not one of those would take an auto case. Mm -hmm. And he never did anything further to examine the subjective complaints. Okay. He didn't do a physical up exam. He didn't order. He didn't order an MRI. He did nothing. He did nothing. Okay. No X-ray. And so now, in the fifth month, he's now finally seen another doctor, and this other doctor is saying, "Yeah, let's order the MRI." I mean, you shouldn't be having complaints this long after right. the accident. Right. So now we're having an MRI this next week, mm -hmm. and obviously, delayed diagnostic studies are going to result in delayed treatment which is going to result in delayed final reports. Okay. Which is going to result in delayed pursuit of claim. Right. So it's important of uh, the primary treating physician to identify all of those primary complaints and to evaluate them, including by MRI if necessary. Mm -hmm and further referral if necessary. So what I'm hearing is um, make sure you're dealing with all the primary complaints and either deal with them personally and move on them, act on them, Correct. or act on them by referring them out to get them moved on. Correct. Don't just leave them dormant. Correct. Okay. And um, you say failure to order MI, MRI, failure to order other. Um, are, are you expecting certain tests or you just want them to do their diagnostics and stay on top of it? Uh, or, I'm expecting that primary physician, you know, say in this hypothetical, I sign up this client and I say, here's your local neighborhood chiropractic physician I think you should go see. Right. That doctor is the captain of the ship. Right. And I think that says it all. Okay. So he needs to be the manager. Correct. Director. Perfect. Okay. Um, Okay, let me ask about while we're on that topic a little bit, the team. How, how important is it that that doctor has his team and medical team in place to send that patient to, that you know as a personal injury attorney, he's got certain other medical providers where he can get it done, so to speak. How important is that? It's key. What other medical providers do you like to see that well, let, that chiropractor has? Well, let's say, sticking with, with captain of the ship, okay. it's the same thing which you just reminded me of, is the quarterback. Right. And the quarterback is basically the captain of the team. And he's got to have a team so he can throw that ball to the player on his team to carry that ball into the end zone. Yeah, I'm aware a lot of chiropractors don't take that responsibility as the quarterback and delegate. What uh, medical providers, so they definitely need medical providers for these other peripheral problems on that they don't treat. What medical providers do you like to see a chiropractor have? Well, the first that comes to mind is a neurologist. Okay. Um, and from, from the personal injury standpoint or viewpoint is like team, it's a stronger case if we're presenting to a jury, number one physician, primary right. treating physician, right. chiropractor, and number two physician, a second opinion, who's a neurologist, who's a medical doctor. Okay. So now when I'm in court or when I'm in trial and we are presenting our evidence and we're making the closing argument and that jury has a verdict form in front of them and they have to answer, at least in Florida, in an auto case, whether or not he or she suffered a permanent injury within a reasonable degree mm -hmm. of medical probability, right. I like to have both the DC and the MD right. as supporting evidence to get that box checked yes. Right. Now you say the neurologist you like to see, what about a uh, neurosurgeon? Well, Second opinion, there's, a, there's a hierarchy, as you know, 
Um, if the patient presents soft tissue, maybe MRI is ordered and there's no objective findings, then there's no further need beyond the chiropractic right. and maybe the neurologist. Right. But if that MRI comes back with a herniated disc, right. then I like to see, if there's nerve impingement, then I like to see the neurologist refer for a neurosurgical consult. Not the chiropractor? Are you okay with the chiropractor for that's a neurosurgical consult? Okay, that's okay. fine too, but okay. the, the checklist in my mind right. is, did the client get to that neurosurgical consult? Okay. Because obviously there's a reason. Well, I'm with you. Let's go into the orthopedist. You, you'd rather see the neurologist neurosurgical consult as opposed to the orthopedist. There's uh, some in, there's some indifference to this, you know. Uh, there's attorneys down the street I know that use those type of doctors uh, or those specialties, and I, I frankly I see very little difference between the two. Okay, okay. So I, from a personal injury standpoint, either one would be same. Fine. Okay, right. I got you. Okay, all right. Uh, what, last question: What about a GP? Having a GP on the team is that any benefit? Yes and no. Um, your accident victim typically says, I, the next day after the accident, went to my GP. Mm -hmm. And with, generally speaking, and by my experience, the GP is not gonna be that physician who documents the injury or has the record keeping that we need mm -hmm. for proving this claim, this injury claim. Second, we typically see he's just going to script the patient some prescriptions. Right. Whereas the best thing is to be in somebody in the hands of a chiropractic physician who can really have that bedside manner, mm -hmm. explain the diagnoses, and start that course of physical therapy. So what I'm hearing is GP really doesn't bring much to the table. Really, uh, the specialist, neurologist, neurosurgeon, orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon. Correct. With okay. the exception that we will bring the GP to trial to, to offer evidence that the person did not have any of these complaints prior to the accident. Gotcha. Okay. All right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Moving forward here, uh, I've got the test. Failure to respond in a timely manner. Help me with that. I've ordered records from Dr. Paul and his office is too busy and doesn't get me the copy of the chart and it takes forever to get me the final narrative report. Not good. Not good. Right. Um, what kind of, you say failure to respond in a timely manner. What's your definition of a timely manner? They, you contact the office. There's an expectancy that if I send you a fax request for a copy of your chart and a narrative report that your office is going to respond in or about within three weeks. Okay. So I can do that demand letter. Okay, so you'll have the records within three weeks. That's mm -hmm. a pretty good amount of time. Okay. Well, there's there's other attorneys that will be calling the very next week. Right. And Or the very next day. Right. And... Um, I understand it can you know, vary. It varies three, depending on the case, okay. but I'm just we're just speaking generally. Right, okay. So that's the what you would say the definition of timely manner. Uh, failure to timely process final report. What's your comment on that? Just like we mentioned, okay. uh, I've ordered the chart and final from Dr. Paul, and he sent me the chart, but I can't get the final. Yeah. You know, I hate to say that, but that's real common. You know, we just we're busy doing our thing, and we just let it go, let it go, and you know, I can easily see. Not that it's right. Not that it's good. Well, in, in the real world example, there's a case I know of right now where I referred the patient to the doctor. I can't get the final report, and next time I'm in that neighborhood signing up another client, right. do you think I'm going right. to think of him when right. I'm saying to the client, the new right. client, where that client should go? Yeah, I'm with you. I know. I'm with you. Uh, you have your excessive billing. Any comments? We talked about that a little bit, but uh, do we probably don't need to go into that anymore here. <clears throat> well, I keep thinking of examples, and you know, when we, ref we refer someone to an office, it's a reflection on us. Right. And if the doctor is excessively billing, then that's that's not good for anyone. Right. Not okay. good for the patient or the doctor or us. Okay. And then uh, refusal r refusal to reasonably negotiate, meaning the doctor also has to be compassionate. 
also has to be a problem solver. Meaning? <laughs> let's, let's, let's use the pie theory. Uh, okay? Sometimes the person we, we are helping was rear-ended by someone that only had small insurance. Right. Maybe, it's only a ten, <clears throat> maybe it's only a 10 policy. And, and this client or patient didn't have any uninsured motorists. Okay. So 10 is 10 and that's all you're going to get. Okay. And just generally speaking. Okay. So in this situation, let's say if the chiropractic physician billed up to $15,000 and he's already been paid from the PIP, the PIP carrier right. probably 8 to 10. Right. And we're at the end of the case and we've collected 10 and he wants all of his five. Well, now you see there was 10 to start with. Yeah. The attorney gets a third. Right. So with $3,333. Right. There's probably some expenses that the attorney incurred, so just add $500. Okay. So now you're up to 35, 36, maybe $3,700. Okay. And then when you say there's other providers, maybe an MRI company that has a diagnostic bill, right? or maybe there was an MD that did Some a second opinion. Liens, yeah. yeah, or maybe a lien, but then you still have the doctor who wants all of his money, so then the patient's looking at you like, this the doctor and the attorney got all the money. Right, okay. Tell you what, we're going to cover that in greater yeah. detail later, but I understand the cost. So basically, um, to some degree willing to work with you based on the ratios of what's available funds-wise. So it's the pie theory. Okay. Now in capping, let's cap this out because we got poor record keeping here. Now these are the major factors that are negative, that negatively impact the case for the personal injury attorney. We got poor record keeping we talked about, um, not being a good quarterback and putting the, uh, the patient's conditions and other providers that can help them immediately or doing the diagnostic testing. Uh, res not responding and excessive billing and failure to negotiate reasonably. I hate to put you on the spot. Which one of these, of these four or five, would you say what is the number one thing that really you don't like that the doctors uh, inhibit or limit the case? Documenting the injury. Okay. Number two. What would number two be, you'd say? Uh, failure to respond in a timely manner. Okay. And then number three? Failure to make appropriate uh, diagnostic testing or okay. referrals. And then uh, four and five would be? Uh, tardy responses. You know, just, yeah. um, I'm sorry. Now that would be I number, really let's see, that. tardy or failure to respond. That'd be number two. Okay. Just not being timely I, with you. I, I think refusal to negotiate. So that would be uh, number four and then billing five? Yeah. That's we might. A, we might put number, f this reason, failure to reasonably negotiate balance, we might put that even up at number two. That's a big one. It can, I can see where yeah. it can be, it depending can, on the numbers. It can, it, can, it can be. It can slow the client down to getting to a closing table, to getting the monies to the client that he or she needs. Yeah, and let's say all the money's there, then this obviously drops to the bottom, or may not even be a factor, right? Yeah, this, we should put this as number one or number two. Okay. Re refusal I mean, to negotiate that, and again, that's if there's limited funds. Yeah. Because if the funds are there and the and the uh, the doctor's funds and the, the patient's funds and the attorney's funds, then this doesn't isn't a one or two, right? Well, I think they're all important factors, but let's remember the patient client comes first. Right. Well, we're so, going to make that assumption yeah. anyway. So uh, here's what we're seeing is the negative factors. Uh, that doctors are doing to negatively impact the personal injury case. And so poor record keeping, and we listed, we enumerated those specifically as an initial report, uh, making sure all the chief complaints are covered, um, accurate prior medical history, all the physical examination findings, all the separate diagnoses, and having a separate plan uh, for those diagnoses. Um, that's all inclusive and in a narrative report format is what we're looking at. So that number one with number two, failing, failure to respond in a timely manner. You, you beg my pardon, can we go back to the billing please, sure. excessive billing? Yeah. I remember that example. I was in the courthouse the other day, I was talking to a defense attorney, and you know what the theme of his case was? That chronic pain management doctor was excessive billing. 
and it was all about greed. Right, right. And that was the theme of the defense attorney's case, and that's what he drove home to the jury. Oh, in trial. In trial. Right. And um, so excessive billing can, can be fatal to a case. Right. I could see that in front of a jury, too. Mm -hmm. More so in front of a jury mm -hmm. than if you're just trying to settle. So. Okay, well, very good. And so we've covered the topics uh, on the factors, the, the negative factors doctors are doing to negatively impact the personal injury case. And again, I'm Dr. Paul on Online Chiropractic Marketing Systems with Brad Souders, personal injury attorney right here in Tampa, Florida. And this is the Chiropractic Personal Injury Marketing Show. You take care. We'll see you later. Bye.